After trying to muzzle the man, often ridiculed for his loose lips, the White House now calls his, shall we say, exuberance an asset. They call it truth-telling and see his talent for connecting as a real advantage. Sometimes maybe I shouldn't be as straightforward as I am, but I'm not going to change that. So I've you're decided not sitting on it. I'm not sitting on it. I am who I am. Cole has made Jim Rogers and his company rich, and that's why we were surprised to hear what this power baron has to say about what coal does to the environment. You know, there are a lot of people, many of them in your industry, many people that you probably know, who say that global warming is not a big problem. It's my judgment, it is a problem. We need to go to work on it now, and it's critical that we start to act in this country. But if it's so critical, why is Rogers still building new coal-burning power plants. You've probably never seen anything as adorable as a five-day-old elephant. But this story is more about her mother. Her name is Mpenzi. She's the large lady lending a helping trunk. Mpenzi didn't grow up in the wild. She was an orphan and was raised here at an orphanage for elephants in Kenya. These kids have all lost a parent, to poachers mainly, and here they're cared for by the gentlest men you've ever met. Not only do they spend all day with their elephants, when it's sleep time, they bed down right next to them. I'm Steve Croft. I'm Leslie Stahl. I'm Bob Simon. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Scott Pelley. Those stories and Andy Rooney tonight on 60 Minutes. The first hundred days of an administration is when the first report cards come out. The president is facing a barrage of tough issues, and he's getting some good marks and some criticism. But what about the vice president? Well, he's still regular Joe, a man deepened by tragedy when his first wife and baby daughter were killed in a car crash in 1972. A senator for 36 years, chairman of two powerful committees, he told us he may have more experience than any vice president ever. And yet, he has a reputation as a gaff machine, a loose cannon who simply talks too much. I asked him if he was worried about doing an interview for 60 Minutes. It's not you I'm afraid of, he said. It's me. But everyone we spoke to at the White House said they don't want him to change. The president and the entire team close to him has encouraged me not to try to all of a sudden be a different Joe Biden than I was for the past 36 years. Sometimes maybe I shouldn't be as straightforward as I am, but I'm not going to change that. So I've you're decided not sitting on it. I'm not sitting on it. I am who I am. After trying to muzzle the man, often ridiculed for his loose lips, the White House now calls his, shall we say, exuberance an asset. They call it truth-telling and see his talent for connecting as a real advantage. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, pal. Let Joe be Joe, with his attaboying, hand-gripping, hot personality versus Obama's cool cat. You seem to be not just yin and yang, but diametric opposites. He's so disciplined. This is not you. He's crisp. This is not you. There's a lot of constituencies out there that want the time, want to hear more than the, as you would say, the crisp answer. They want somebody who's going to take the time and have the time to listen to them. And that's you. That's basically my job, and I like engaging with people. You only have to stand for hey, president. Call him schmoozer in chief. Joe Biden. And as he told this audience in St. Louis, he loves being vice president. When I was United States Senator and a powerful chairman, I'd have to plead. Uh, now I can just call a cabinet meeting. They all show up. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, he is number two. And the question of how he's dealing with the transition from powerful senator to the guy standing behind the much younger president has become a Washington parlor question. He admitted to me that after 36 years being his own boss, the first hundred days have been a period of adjustment. When you say that you, uh, the, your own man kind of thing, versus yeah. working basically well, for someone else. Yeah. So what, what? Well, it's like, for example, I, I would ordinarily have uh, picked up the phone and called the captain 
of that ship oh, as chairman of the Foreign right, Relations right, Committee. Right. Well, it's not appropriate for me to do that. I mean, the president did it right away. You follow me? And yes. It's, so yes, it's of a, course. you know, thing. I mean, little things. They're 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 really not big things, but little things. It's not quite as big as my Senate office, but it was. Your secret, Senate office you know. was bigger. Is that well, true? I, yeah, it is true. He hasn't had much time to worry about the little things because there have been so many big things from Afghanistan to bailouts to torture memos, which means, he told me, he's been spending a lot of time with the president. You want it to be, I've heard the expression, uber advisor. You want it to be involved in all the issues and be the last person in the room when he makes a decision. Well, the has first part worked? is too sophisticated a term for me. But, um, <laughs> but, but has it worked yes, out? Yes, it has worked out. On every major decision, the president has actually sought my advice. Joe Biden's doing an outstanding job. The president wants everyone to know, his team and us, Hello. in case there's any question, that he thinks he made a brilliant choice. He's pretty fearless in offering his opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he's oftentimes willing to to make the contrarian argument and really forces people to think and defend their positions. Uh, and that ends up being very valuable for me. Does he argue with you? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Joe's not uh, afraid to tell me what he thinks. Then that's exactly what I need and exactly what I want. And that's why I've asked Vice President Biden to lead a tough, unprecedented oversight effort. Because nobody messes with Joe. With so much on his plate, the president has made his number two the stimulus cop. The assignment? To see that the $787 billion in stimulus money is spent wisely. You cannot take that money and, you know, put it in a rainy day fund or whatever. He's on the phone several hours a week with mayors and governors, making sure they follow the rules. But don't come back and tell me you build a swimming pool because it doesn't pass the smell test. It does seem like the administration is saying, we can do it all. The spending, not have taxes, all of that. Maybe you're not completely leveling with us, that your assumptions are too rosy. This was just what the administration yeah. was not supposed to be doing. What we have done is we have taken what are the consensus estimates on the low side of what we think is going to happen. But I keep hearing that we're going to have high, really high unemployment well, till the end of 2010. Look, it took us a long time to get into this, and it's going to take us a while to get out. That's why we're investing the money we're investing in this recovery package. Had we not done that, things would be a great deal worse. Is this the right time to fix all of that? Or is the economy in such bad shape that the deficits are going to get out of hand in the future? Well, that's the fear. There that's is right. a fear. It's a legitimate fear. Okay. There's only one way to keep it from happening reduce our energy cost and reduce our health care cost. The only question is when. That's the only now. question. Now. 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 All his expertise doesn't mean the White House rests easy when the vice president is holding forth. His penchant for bloopers still makes them nervous. The president himself once called them Joe's rhetorical flourishes, like this one. If we do everything right, we do it with absolute certainty there's still a 30% chance we're going to get it wrong. The gaffes. He's actually shown some displeasure with you in public. That's you? true. Uh, that, that had happened in the past. Um, and uh, quite frankly, the president uh, um, said to me he was sorry that it was taken out of context, his body language on one of those cases. His body language, when Mr. Biden made fun of the Chief Justice's flubbing at the inaugural swearing in of the president. My memory is not as good as Justice Roberts. The president moves in with a disapproving tap and a tight-lipped grimace. Do you talk it out, take them to the woodshed? or Are you uh, candid enough with each no, other? We that? are, actually. And if Joe was off message on a particular day, uh, Usually I don't have to bring it up. He's the first one to come to me and say, you know what, I'm not sure that's exactly how we want to position ourselves. Uh, the flip side is, if I'm off message, uh, he's not going to be bashful about saying, you know, Mr. President, I think uh, really? you know, we, we might want to steer uh, more in that direction. Does it make me susceptible to being a target? Yeah, it does. A little it's, bit of lampooning yeah, kind well, of stuff? Yeah, well, you know, much of the ridicule of me is well-deserved. <laughs> the vice president gets especially high marks as a team player. For those who predicted he and the Secretary of State would be rivals, they both say, uh-uh. 
And in fact, they meet for a policy breakfast every Tuesday. He has been at the highest levels of American foreign policy decision making. And we all listen to him. Mr. Biden prides himself in knowing how the world works. So what about the criticism that the president's been too chummy with some of our adversaries? The Republicans are hammering away on this handshake that the president had with Hugo Chavez. And whether it conveyed some kind of lack of toughness on his part. Do you think Hugo Chavez or anyone else in the world thinks that Barack Obama shaking hands with a man who's invited to a conference with him, who's president of another country, who walks up to him and shakes his hand, do you think they think that's weakness? I think it expresses confidence. And then there's something else that's bubbling. And this is a direct quote okay. from Dick Cheney, saying that he finds it disturbing that Mr. Obama apologizes all the time. Our enemies will be quick to take advantage of a situation if they think they're dealing with, quote, a weak president. Look, I don't know what he's apologized for. For example, saying we should close Guantanamo is not an apology, it's a reflection of a fact that the policy that we engaged in made us weaker in the world. He didn't go out and say, oh my God, the fact that the last administration did these things were so sorry. He didn't say, he just said, we don't do torture anymore. Would you mind taking a picture of us? We joined him on a trip to Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri last week. Mr. Biden feels a special bond with military audiences. His own son, Bo, a captain in the Army National Guard, was sent to Iraq in November when his unit was called up. Flying back to Washington on Air Force Two, I asked him if he worries about his son's safety. I've ridden home with too many dead young men and women in caskets. Um, and, um, and it's just impossible to uh, not associate with that. I mean, you think as a parent, God forbid, how would I, how would I respond? But do you ever say, my God, my own son is there? Well, you know, I, I don't know how to answer that. I, um, the way I deal with it is I don't think about it that way. I'm proud of him. He's a good man. He still calls both his sons, Hunter 39 and Bo, now 40, honey. Actually, I do. I, I, I do. How do they feel about it? Well, I think they feel good about it. When we see each other, we hug and kiss. But after my wife and daughter were killed, um, I don't know quite what happened, but I found myself being maybe more in physically embrace of my little boys. He's physically embraceive with everybody, total strangers. He hugs, he slaps, he punches, grabs, holds, noses in, and bumps foreheads. Children are a special magnet. He and his wife, Jill, work them like a rope line of voters on a campaign. And he cannot resist speechifying, even when his audience is made up of six-year-olds. Let me tell you something. A couple of you asked me a question. And what inspired you to want to be the vice president? And what inspired me to be vice president was a guy some of you know, Barack Obama. <laughs> He tried to be president, but you know what? He's better than I was. The Bidens have been married for 31 years. In addition to the two sons, they have a daughter, Ashley. They've lived a modest life in Delaware. Mrs. Biden, a professor of English, still teaches at a community college. You come home in great papers at night? Every night. She I, carries I, the papers <laughs> everywhere. Well, no different than most American women who are raising children and working. They both seem to be getting a kick out of living in a big mansion now. Joe Biden was always one of the poorest senators. They always said that every time the tax returns came out. Joe Biden, one that of the poorest. <laughs> now he's the poorest vice president. <laughs> the vice president likes to talk about his working class roots as he goes around the country telling average Americans how all the stimulus money is going to help them. We have $500 million in this to train people for green jobs. I could hear the ka-ching, ka-ching, the cost of all this. What's happened here is we inherited a yearly debt of $1.2 trillion. We're going to cut that debt we inherited in half within the first four years. Oh, come on. No, we are. With but all the spending? With all the spending. And no saying. taxes on any part of the middle class? 
No, no additional taxes. The tax cuts for the middle class. You're rosy. I'm, I, don't, I think I'm realistic. I think I'm realistic. So is the vice president really unleashed? There's a sense he's trying to find a balance between watching his tongue, he hasn't made a gaffe since early February, and just being Joe. For more behind the scenes with Vice President Biden, go to 60minutes.com. The future of our climate might be summed up in one question. What do we do about coal? Coal generates nearly half the electricity in the United States and in the world, but it is the dirtiest fuel of all when it comes to carbon dioxide, or CO2, the leading greenhouse gas. A few days ago, the Obama administration declared for the first time that CO2 is a threat to human health and it plans to impose limits, but making coal safe will come at an astronomical cost. After the economy, this could be the biggest debate in Washington. And one of the most influential people in all of this is Jim Rogers. Cole has made Rogers and his company rich, and that's why we were surprised to hear what this high-flying power baron has to say about what coal does to the environment. Jim Rogers wanted us to see America's enormous dependency on coal, so he flew us out to one of his 20 coal-burning power plants. I remember the first time I took a helicopter to look down at a power plant like this. I was 41 years old, and I said, oh my goodness, I'm responsible for that? Rogers is the CEO of Duke Energy, the nation's third largest electric utility. His smokestacks pump out 100 million tons of carbon dioxide every year, which makes what comes out of Rogers' mouth so surprising. Controlling carbon emissions in the near future is inevitable, in your view. This is going to happen. It's inevitable, in my judgment. You're one of the biggest polluters in the world when it comes to carbon emissions. We're one of the largest emitters, and it tells you how daunting the challenge is that we have in front of us. You know, there are a lot of people, many of them in your industry, many people that you probably know, who say that global warming is not a big problem. It's my judgment. It is a problem. We need to go to work on it now. And it's critical that we start to act in this country. Like a reformed tobacco executive, Rogers says we can't survive the emissions his industry creates. He showed us what he means at a North Carolina power station that can light up one and a half million homes. How much coal does this plant burn in a, in a given day? Every day this plant burns roughly 19,000 tons of coal. That's two train loads and each train has about 100 cars. This is what that looks like. See the train in the foreground and the train in the background? It's the same train, a mile long. The fact is, America runs on coal, and here's one of the reasons why. The Powder River Basin that stretches across Wyoming and Montana may be the largest coal reserve on Earth. We've got 200 years worth of reserves, cheap and right under our feet. No wonder coal generates half of our electricity. But here's the brutal part. Coal is twice as dirty as natural gas and puts more carbon dioxide in the air than all of our cars and trucks. In short, we're caught between a rock and a hot place. You know, I notice all of this coming out of the stacks. What is that? That's good news. When you see a plume coming out of a stack of a power plant, that's vapor, and it basically says that this is, the emissions have been cleaned. The power industry spent billions in the 1990s cleaning up much of the sulfur and nitrogen oxides that cause acid rain. But those pollutants are mere drops in a stream of carbon dioxide. Rogers says getting rid of the carbon will require a new federal law to limit emissions and a new technology to clean up coal. At the same time, he says Duke will transition to more wind, solar, and nuclear power. Our goal line is to substantially to reduce our carbon footprint, to decarbonize our business by 2050. Four decades? It's a long time. Well, it took 100 years to get to where we are, and, and we can't do this overnight. 2050 is too late. We will have guaranteed disasters for our children, grandchildren, and the unborn. 
Jim Hansen is NASA's top climate scientist. He's credited with some of the earliest and most accurate projections on climate change. He thinks that Roger's plan leaves the Earth in the oven decades too long. We are going to have to phase out emissions from coal within the next 20 years if we hope to prevent climate disasters. Are you saying that we can't build any new coal-fired power plants in this country? Absolutely, not only in this country, but in the world. The, this is not yet understood, that we are going to have to have a moratorium on new coal-fired power plants within the next few years and phase out the existing ones over the next 20 years or so if we hope to preserve a climate like the one that has existed the last several thousand years. You know, Jim Rogers will hasten to tell you he does share your sense of urgency. Well, his plan doesn't match that. In fact, right now, Rogers is building two new coal plants. You're talking a great game, but you're building coal-fired power plants. I am following through on what is job one for me, making sure my customers have affordable, reliable, clean electricity. And if we abandon coal at this point? We can't abandon coal. We have to find a way to keep it and use it in the future, and that means the ability to clean it up. Roger's plan of cleaning it up over 40 years involves something that the coal and power industries promote as clean coal technology. In fact, they say we can't live without it. We have to continue to advance new clean coal technologies. If we don't, we may have to say goodbye to the American way of life we all know and love. It is a seductive idea. Cleaning up the carbon would solve everything. And during the presidential campaign, both candidates endorsed clean coal. But this is America. We figured out how to put a man on the moon in 10 years. You can't tell me we can't figure out how to burn coal that we mine right here in the United States of America and make it work. Well, we they did that. find a way to make it work. The problem and is clean way, coal makes putting a man on the moon look easy. The technology is called carbon capture and sequestration. We found the only place you can see it in America, the Basin Electric Power Cooperative in North Dakota. Basin captures half of its CO2, but they didn't build this because of climate change. This is the carbon dioxide going into the ground. Long before anyone heard of global warming, Basin was conceived in the Carter administration to prove that America could use its own fuel, coal, and turn it into natural gas. They had to take the carbon out because it was an impurity. Before you started pumping it into the ground and into the pipeline, where did it come out? That, pot, that stack right up there. Carbon capture takes the carbon dioxide, turns it into a liquid, and pumps it underground. Virtually everyone agrees, industry, environmentalists, and politicians, that this is the only way we know to make coal safe for the planet. But consider, Taxpayers built this for one and a half billion dollars in the 1980s. That would be four billion today. Dan Kamen says carbon capture would be an enormous national engineering project. He's a Berkeley physicist and top expert on energy. Can enough carbon capture and sequestration facilities like this one be built in time to prevent climate change from coal? I don't think anyone knows the answer to that precisely. We know we have to try, and we know that these facilities do work. Whether we can build enough of them to preserve the coal industry as it is today, I think is a question. How many coal-fired power plants are there in the United States? We have hundreds of coal-fired power plants. And each one of those would need one of these carbon capture sequestration plants That's attached right. to it. That's right. What are we talking about here in terms of infrastructure? So we're talking about hundreds of billions to trillion dollars or so and every power plant needs to capture its greenhouse gases. Wait, did I just hear you say a trillion dollars? A trillion dollars. With a T. With a T. Joe Rome thinks a trillion might be optimistic. Rome ran alternative fuel projects in the Clinton administration. He says the amount of CO2 we're talking about is mind-boggling. If the world did this uh, at scale, it would be the equivalent amount of CO2 going into the ground as oil now comes out of the ground. So you have to recreate the entire oil delivery infrastructure of the planet, which was built up over a century, just to deal with this CO2. Is it practical? 
That we don't know yet. No one has ever taken large volumes of CO2 and stuck it in these deep underground aquifers and then measured and verified that it stays there permanently. I mean, after all, if it doesn't stay there permanently, if it leaks out slowly, it's not saving the climate. Remember, we've spent 30 years just trying to get one repository for nuclear waste, Yucca Mountain, and we haven't succeeded. Now we're going to need dozens and dozens of repositories for CO2. It is not impossible. What we need in this country is what I would call a Marshall Plan. We rebuilt the economies of Japan and Germany after World War II. We need to rebuild our economy and transition it to a low carbon economy. We can do that, but it's going to take trillions of dollars to do it. Trouble is, there is a Marshall Plan today. And it's rebuilding Wall Street. Add to that Congress's projection of record federal deficits of a trillion dollars. And it turns out not even the industry that warns of the end of our way of life is paying for it. How much has Duke Energy invested in carbon sequestration technology so far? We have not invested any dollars in the technology per se. We have spent a lot of time and money reviewing and analyzing the various technologies. But come on, you admit to being the third largest carbon producer in the United States. You tell me that carbon sequestration is the future because we can't afford to live without coal, but then you tell me you haven't invested any money in carbon sequestration. While we haven't spent the money on sequestration technology, we spent the time and energy and that we're gonna co-invest with the government when this technology evolves. If capturing carbon in the U.S. is decades away, consider that China and India now put more carbon in the air than we do, and the Chinese are opening coal-fired plants at a rate of one a week. None captures its carbon. Now, Rogers has broken ground on his two new coal-fired plants, despite warnings from top scientists like NASA's Jim Hansen. So when Jim Hansen says that to save the planet, we should stop building coal-fired power plants today, you say what? I say, Mr. Hansen, can't get done, won't get done. We've got to keep our economy going. We've got to make the transition. And I'm going to do everything I can with the greatest sense of urgency to make the transition. But to do what you asked me to do now is just not doable. President Obama wants to speed up cleaner technologies by taxing utilities for the carbon they produce. But that idea is meeting some stiff resistance in Congress. Can you imagine an orphanage that's a happy place? We couldn't, but then we found one. The kids don't arrive here smiling, like orphans all over the world. They've been abandoned. They're hungry, sad, and desperate. But after a few years, they're healthy, well-fed, and, well, happy. The orphanage is in Kenya, outside Nairobi. And we might as well tell you now, it's an orphanage for elephants. They've been orphaned because their parents, their mothers mainly, have died, or more likely been killed in the bush. Poachers kill large elephants for their ivory. A young elephant can only survive a day or two without milk. So the orphanage's first job is to find the orphans, fly them to the orphanage, and before anything else, feed them. The principal of the orphanage, the principal, headmistress, head nurse, and CEO, is Dame Daphne Sheldrick. She founded the place, has been working with elephants for 50 years. This is little Sugutu. This is the one that was in a coma oh, right. when she arrived. Was on a drip for for um, 24 hours. We mm -hmm. never thought she'd see be alive in the morning. So she's our little miracle. This one. But Daphne's problem is that she's caring for too many miracles. Poachers are killing more and more elephants for their tusks, creating more and more orphans. There's a record number of orphans here right now, because Daphne says. The sale of ivory has been legalized for the first time in 10 years. A few African countries have been given the right to sell their ivory stockpiles, more than 100 tons of tusks, to China and Japan. And conservationists point out 
This is yet another blow to Africa's elephants. Do you see any correlation between the decision to auction off the ivory and the number of orphans? We do. Every time ivory is auctioned legally, there's a, a rise in poaching. And we also see the correlation in, in the price that's paid to the poacher for illegal ivory. Is the price going up? It's gone from 300 shillings a kilo to 5,000. That's about a thousand dollars a tusk. And in Kenya, the number of elephants killed by poachers has increased by 45% this year alone. A rather amazing rise, isn't it? It is. It's, it's a scary, frightening rise. Poachers were behind the death of this elephant. Her trunk was caught in one of their snares, and she had no way of feeding herself or her six-week-old baby boy. He just couldn't accept the fact that his mother was dead, so he continued trying to suckle. Eventually, the keepers got him to drink their milk. They called him Shimba, and he was in such bad shape that nobody thought he would survive. But then he was brought to the orphanage and things began going his way. He's 27 months old now and is in very good shape. Very muscular, very strong, and he's beginning to grow tusks. He never stops eating. In fact, that's the first love of every orphan here, eating. The institution has a dining area and that's all. As we found out when we first dropped by here three years ago, it has everything you'd want in an orphanage, dormitories, each orphan has a private room, a communal bath, and a playground. The regimen at the orphanage is anything but Dickensian. Unlike Oliver Twist, when one of these orphans asks for more, that's what he gets, more. Ultimately, Daphne finds elephants more sympathetic than people. What is the most extraordinary thing you have learned about elephants? Their tremendous capacity for caring is, I think, perhaps the most amazing thing about them, even at a very, very young age. Their sort of forgiveness and selfishness. So, you know, I, I often say, as I think I've said before, they have all the, the best attributes of us humans and not very many of the bad. Just about the best people you've ever met are the gentlemen who work here. Keepers, they're called, and they have extraordinary jobs. There is one keeper per elephant. He'll spend 24 hours a day with his charge, seven days a week. A keeper feeds his elephant every three hours, day and night, just like mom would. He keeps his elephant warm, not like mom would, but with a blanket. And when it's sleep time, he beds down right next to his elephant. If he leaves, if ever so briefly, the baby wakes up and broadcasts his displeasure. The keepers are rotated now and then, so that no elephant gets too terribly attached to any one of them. At dawn, the elephants are taken from their dorms out to the bush. They hang out for a while, play some games. Come on, here. Roleni, Roleni, come on. Roleni, come on. Soccer is a favorite. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And guess who decides when it's halftime? <laughs> The days are pretty much the same here, but on Fridays, the orphanage becomes a spa. You want to rub her down? Go on, rub her down. The keepers give the elephants a coconut oil massage. We can't do exactly what the mother can do, but we do something close to that. You're a surrogate mother. You're... Yes, yes. Edwin Lucici is the head of the keepers. He is the chief elephant man. This one here is Luwaleni. Roleni is the, the oldest female we have, 16 months as well. The tiny one here is uh, Makena. <laughs> <laughs> right. I always want to be close with Roleni. <laughs> yes, well, they always want to be close to each other and to you, don't they? Um, I'm afraid this interview with Edmund is getting rudely interrupted. <laughs> yes. But there's really not that much to do. They may be little, they may be orphans, but trust me, yeah. they're not as little as they look. <laughs> in fact, I feel like I'm in an elephant sandwich. Yes, you are. <laughs> Perhaps the problem was we had not been properly introduced. There is a protocol to meeting an elephant. He will offer up his trunk and he expects you to blow in it. That way, he will remember your scent forever. You will never be strangers again. The, the little baby's been captured. The orphanage gets distress calls from all over Kenya, from all over East Africa, that a baby elephant is on his own, 
often because his mother has been killed by a poacher. It is then a matter of great urgency. An orphaned elephant can only survive a few days without his mother. The baby elephant is loaded onto a plane and flown back to Daphne Sheldrick's orphanage outside Nairobi, where he'll stay until he's strong enough to go back into the bush. Dame Daphne has been running the orphanage for almost 30 years. She was born and raised in Kenya and married David Sheldrick, Africa's leading crusader against poaching. When he died in 1977, she founded the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. Daphne saw her mission as saving as many elephants as possible, but she has never permitted herself too much hope. That's because she loses half the elephants that arrive here, some from pneumonia, some from trauma. This elephant probably witnessed its mother's death and remembers everything. That's the double-edged sword of having the memory of an elephant they never forget. Um, you know, he's still grieving for his elephant family. He's in shock, he's distressed. Do you believe a baby elephant can die of grief? Oh yes, I know it can. They're terribly, terribly fragile. You've got mm. to try and turn the psyche around, duplicating what that elephant would have had in an elephant family, touching them, talking to him gently. In other words, love. Tender loving care, TLC mm. and a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Daphne and the keepers may run this place officially, but it's the elephants who are really in charge. For example, when a new keeper is hired, he's on probation for three months. Then, if the elephants like him, he's got a job. If not, he's out. What do you try to teach them? Well, we have to teach them not to be naughty, not to push around with the others, mm -hmm. uh, to obey one another. Just like you have to do to your children, your own children, mm -hmm. uh, to respect the others. Mm -hmm. And the keepers teach the elephants how to be elephants. There are wild elephant things these kids don't know how to do. Mother wasn't around to teach them. Things like covering themselves in dust to prevent sunburn. The keepers do it with shovels until the elephants pick it up themselves. The orphanage has an infirmary and the doctor has a call to make. One of the elephants is not doing well at all. He's been on antibiotics for two days now, but he can barely breathe. All this froth that's coming out of his trunk has got to be pulmonary edema. His room looks like an intensive care unit. The doctor, Daphne, and the keepers don't leave him for a minute. They do everything they can, but it's not enough. By dawn, he is dead. How do you manage going through this all the time? We well, don't have much option, do you? There's another one to look after, and then another one coming, and you know, you just have to turn the page. And you get attached to one. But I'm not very good at it. And you're not going to get any better, are you? No. Not after 50 years. But then you go and you hang out with the the orphans who are doing so well, and it brings joy to your life. Absolutely. It's actually a pretty lush life for these elephants here at the orphanage, but it's not the life of a wild elephant. It's not their destiny. So like any good school, this place prepares its students to leave, to get ready for life in the real world, to go back to the wild from whence they came. This young lady left Daphne's orphanage to go live in the wild. Her name is Mpenzi, and a couple of years ago, she became pregnant and decided to go off on her own to give birth without the protection of her extended family. That was a mistake. Before the sun could set, Mpenzi and her baby were surrounded by a pride of 16 lions. Keeper Joseph Sawney was called to the scene and captured the events on his still camera. So Mpenzi was standing there trying to, to scare off lions with a trunk. Yeah. But when they came, she tried to push them on this side, others come at the back. And Penza didn't have a chance. Yeah. How did you and the other keepers react? Uh, it was so, so sad. In fact, uh, everybody was crying. And there was nothing they could do to save the baby. It was a brutal lesson for Mpenzi. Nature has its own laws. They're a long way from the sheltered world of the orphanage. But this story has a happy ending. Just days before we arrived, Mpenzi gave birth to another little girl. The keepers have all come out to cheer her on. They named her Asante. 
which in Swahili means thank you. And Penzi has learned her lesson. This time she makes sure her bundle of joy is surrounded by other members of the family. They help her up when she falls down and rescue her when she tumbles into a mud hole. So for the moment, Asante will be safe, at least until she grows tusks. So many elephants are being poached for their tusks that in the four months since we broadcast this story, 16 orphaned elephants have arrived at the orphanage, and Dame Daphne is expecting more. And now, a few minutes with Andy Rooney. When I was about 12 years old, I remember at Christmas one year being ashamed of how much I liked it because of all the presents I got. It was a pretty complicated thought for a 12-year-old kid, but I had it. I've always liked presents, though. People send me a lot of things, and I wish they wouldn't, but I can't help liking them. Look at this. Just a few of the things that have come in recently. This is a bottle of some kind of sauce. Now, it's probably very good and from someone who likes me, but it could be very bad and from someone who hates me, too, so I don't dare eat it. Someone sent me this sports whistle. Why would anyone send me a whistle? The package says it's made of solid brass. It's triple plated and it has an extra sharp tone. Well, good for it, but I certainly wouldn't want a whistle that was only double plated and made of brass that wasn't solid. This goes under a door to keep the draft out. Someone's idea of what John McCain and Barack Obama look like. Not my idea of what either of them look like, but what do I know? The American government in action. This is a game. I never cared much for games. There's enough to play with in real life. The Baseball Dictionary. This book has a lot more than I want to know about baseball. I'm a football fan. Baseball is too caught up with numbers for me. This is a pair of socks. I don't know who they're for. They'd come up over my knees. I don't know what these two bags are for. Why would I want two of them anyway? This is called almond orange honey. Seems like a good idea, and the bees have certainly done their job. But I never liked honey. I said I liked fudge and that I never got any good fudge anymore. I haven't had any good fudge in years, so a lot of people sent me good fudge. I mean, I guess it's good. I haven't eaten all of it yet. I said I shine my own shoes. The letter that came with this stuff says it brings leather back to life. Nice to think about bringing leather back to life, isn't it? I'll see if this brings my shoes back to life. I just hope my shoes don't eat my fudge. I'm Steve Croft. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes.